Hi, welcome to Weplon Air. My name is Michelle Ponto. I am the Senior Communications Advisor here at Kaus. I'm here today with the guests, the teams from uh, Cinematic Science, Ian, Mark, and John. Welcome to Weplon Air. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So um, the first question I'm going to ask you is, communicating science is not new. It's been around forever, but I'm hearing a lot more about it in the media. What has changed and why is it more important now than ever? Well, I guess it's probably never been more important to actually communicate science effectively for a number of reasons. Um, you know, the world faces some significant global challenges, you know, everything from climate change to growing human populations and growing affluence and increasing use of natural resources. We, we face some pretty significant issues and science obviously has a critical role in playing in terms of trying to solve them and, and help come up with solutions. But we really need to be more effective in communicating, you know, our discoveries as scientists more effectively to policymakers, to the public, so that it's actually relevant. And I guess the second, uh, the second reason I would say was actually would be um, mainly because also, well, paradoxically at the same time, science seems to be under attack. I mean, we hear more and more criticism of scientists and expert opinion and, you know, evidence, the evidence base is ignored by politicians or the public. You know, we hear the whole concept of fake news, for example. So there's more and more importance of actually getting our message more, across more effectively. Mm -hmm. And I feel like we need to take more responsibility ourselves as scientists. You know, we can complain about how our research is interpreted by the media, but now it's never been easier to get your story out there and have a little bit of control yourself. So, I mean, I, th I think we sort of think this is happening at two levels. One, um, the fact that with the, uh, you know, the phone in your pocket, you've got a really sophisticated video production tool. You can get little add-on mics and things that make them even better, but we can all broadcast our message. Um, and then at the, you know, I don't know, John might, you might want to talk a little bit about the, the higher end of the scale, things like virtual reality and things which are new opportunities. Yeah, there's a lot of new ways of telling stories. Virtual reality is one of them. You, you may have seen people with funny looking headsets and they're doing a hackathon here uh, where it's just new ways of putting people in new spaces. Um, a lot of people are calling these new technologies, virtual reality is uh, an empathy machine. Puts you in this unique environment where you may have never been before. Could be on uh, a reef, or could be in the jungle, or could be in uh, Syria. Um, but there's all these great issues um, that people don't know about, and being able to use new technologies is is what we're excited about. Is trying to tell these these great stories. Yeah, I guess the other point that I'd make as well is, is also is that. Um, I guess for scientists and for students, it's actually equally important to actually be effective science communicators. It's never been more important to be an effective science communicator, primarily because um, well, we've all heard the, the adage, publish or perish, but it's gone beyond that. You know, we need to actually get our, we have to have impact as scientists. Uh, and for students and, and you know, for science, up and coming scientists now, there's opportunities to actually push into different areas in terms of career advancement and career opportunities around science communication. So it's, yeah, it's not only a really important time to be a science communicator, but it's also a really exciting time for that reason and also because the, you know, the, the digital revolution, if you like, has made things much more easier to, to, you know, to, to create engaging and new content. I think the last point as well is that science communication is fun. You know, and especially we've been uh, working with some fantastic graduate students this week uh, doing a video production course. And um, you, know, you can just see them really become really engaged and excited about telling their story and, and sharing it um, you know, with their friends, with their family, and, uh, and then broadcast, broadcasting it out to the world. What is your process if a scientist came to you and said, I have some really great research and want to get out there? How would you break it down, the science talk to normal person talk? And how would you decide, because not everything's going to be virtual reality mm -hmm. compatible mm -hmm. and others will have different sort of, you know, some are more visual, some are more data. How, how do you break it down and decide which would be best for this research? Oh, I don't mind running with this one first. So um, we have a few questions we usually ask the scientists when they first come in. Um, you know, first and foremost, who's your audience? So that's going to really change what sort of tools you use. Um, and you've got to think about what are your key messages? And we really try to you know, scientists know so much about their topic and sometimes that can be a little bit of an uh, impediment to communication because they just want to pack all this information in. So we just ask them to even sometimes just write down or just get across one or two key messages. What are the most significant findings? And I guess the third thing is what's the context? What are the real world implications for what you're doing? Um, and, and what character is involved? Because that's really going to help tell your story. So something can be really quite, you know, difficult to get your head around. It might be something about um, you know, mathematical modeling. But if you have some strong characters and you have some, even showing the passion of the scientists, um, then you've got some good opportunities to communicate that and get people engaged. Yeah, one, one way I like to think about it too is, you know, you want to be able to explain 
your project, your science, your findings to, you know, to a to a to an older child or you know to your mum or to you know to a family member. So it has to be kind of simplified to that level. And I and I believe that it doesn't matter what how complex your science is. I think you you can do it. You know, I mean, even Einstein has that classic <coughs> quote saying mm -hmm. that if you can't explain you know, what you're talking about in simple, you, you, you're going too complex and you're getting too far ahead of yourself. So I think, you know, there's, you, you can do it at that level. Yeah, and that's we, what we sort of we, try um, to start with. <clears throat> we generally, we tr generally try to tell good stories. And the stories are usually involve people, people and their background and their, their history. <laughs> we, you know, we, we always ask, you know, what, what are you most passionate about? You know, there's a lot, you have your, your research, huge amounts of data. What in there is really exciting to you? It doesn't really matter the subject. It's, I mean, it's science, but we, it could be any subject. Mm -hmm. What in that piece of information is most exciting to you? That's what we're going to try and get across and just make it into a little one to two minute video. So. And I, I guess as well, like, um, one, one thing we want to um, clarify is that uh, I mean, we're scientists ourselves, we're, we're passionate science communicators, but this doesn't replace um, traditional ways of communicating. We're not saying don't write scientific papers, um, don't publish your data, um, you know. We still want that to happen, but what we want to do is create those little hooks that get people interested or just, you know, provide the tools so that scientists that are uh, often funded by a lot of government funding, you know, this comes from taxpayers, we want to make sure that those messages get back to the people that make decisions and also back to the people that paid for that research in the first place because, you know, if, if as a taxpayer, if you're paying for some research to be done and you, you never get any information back about it in a way that you can understand it, then it's not really a fair go. And I, I think that's been part of the problem um, with this disconnect and, uh, and maybe distrust in science. Okay. With a, it, would, like, it would be great if every scientist can just come to you and have, him, have you do his, his PR for him and his communication strategy. But not all of them are going to be able to do that. Um, and of course, their communications department and their university are going to send out the press release. They're going to do. They'll be published in some magazines. What can the scientists do to keep up the momentum and really communicate back to his peers and reach his public directly? What can they do themselves, or what should they be doing? Well, I think uh, we made the point in our course too that um, one of the one of the first things that when you're starting a project, for example, is just to you know to make sure that you you're sort of taking photos and maybe video of the mm. process of what you're doing. You know, you say your methods or whatever it is, and as you're going through your project, you you build up this body of um, you know of content effectively, which you can then have options to put together later on, right? So, um, I guess that's where it would begin. Mm. Uh, that's a a great point. I mean, I think there's scientists are often very time poor and can be um, quite limited resources as well. So, um, and this is the same for our projects as scientists. So a couple of things I like to encourage, one is a, a five minute communications plan. So when you're starting a project, you know you're gonna be going for permits, ethics, you're gonna be creating budgets for the research, designing experiments. We should also think about how your research is gonna be communicated. Uh, because a lot of times your funders or the university, that's what they're interested in, um, even more than the actual findings. Uh, we love the idea of an electronic media pack, and all that means is a, you just have a file on your computer, and you take photos, shoot some video, like rough cuts, you don't have to edit it. Keep them in that file, because two years later, when you're doing a presentation about your public, published research or the media release comes out, you're going to have that footage. Um, you know, we have some people in our course that are working on uh, giant clamp research. And if they just have some footage in a file when they do their media release, they can send that to the out with the media release, and the news um, agencies, all they have to do is interview her and, um, and then use that footage, and, and that's going to really increase the impact of the research. Yeah, I guess it, sorry, yeah, the other point that I was going to make just on that as well is that, you know, we're seeing the, cha the changing face not only of science but of media and uh, yourself, like journalists, and how things are changing for journalists and let fewer and fewer resources and it's harder you need to get deadlines and mm. et cetera. So a scientist is at an, an advantage if they can provide content to that journalist when they come looking for a story. And then you, you've actually got more control over that story in a sense too because you're providing you know, more guidance. So I guess in a time sort of stressed uh, you know, time for, for journalists, it's actually an advantage to, to have those sort of media packs or that content to, ready to go. And, so. and the course we've been teaching the last couple of days is how to do everything with your phone, how to shoot video, mm -hmm. how to edit a video on your phone. Everyone's got these high-powered pers uh, personal computers in their pocket. Just while you're doing your research, as we've said, take out your phone, grab a couple of video clips, it could be pouring a beaker, it could be whichever type of research you're doing, just grab a couple of video clips and put it in a Dropbox, save it for later. You might need it a couple years from now when you need to show someone 
what you did two years back. And I think maybe the last opportunity is, um, you know, you do have the opportunity now to build your own brand as a scientist through some really, you know, everything's uh, free. So you can use, a lot of scientists are now pretty comfortable with Twitter. Um, but there's other scientists that might, you know, you might be decide that you, your research is really important for younger people. You might use Instagram or, or Snapchat or something like that. So there's all these new tools which are available. Um, we, we sort of run our own businesses by running our own labs, but maybe we need to be our own brand as well. And if that's not you, like maybe you're just not the person who wants to be the public face, well, maybe do it with your team. Maybe someone in your team is that person to be the public face. Um, but that way people can find you online and find out more about what you do. Talking about the brand, a lot of scientists, you know, I know you're working, you're working, you're working, you're, and you're ready to promote when your paper is done, which could be yours, and then there might be a big lull in between. What can they be doing in the meantime to con continue their brand and continue excitement around their research in between research? Yeah, I don't think you necessarily need a finished product, obviously, mm -hmm. to start talking about it, you know what I mean? Uh, we, we, I mean, personally, Ian and I work in the field of environmental biology, so we're out in the field a lot, and we, you know, we work with marine animals or terrestrial wildlife or whatever. So, I guess that makes it quite conducive to getting some, you know, interesting shots. Uh, and you know, the process of, for example, catching a shark and tagging it, you know, is really, is really, I mean, that's really charismatic sort of mm. footage, or you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's good stuff. So, you can start pushing that out there, and you can get, you can make a story about your actual methodology. Um, before you even have the actual you know, story about what the results of your study is actually trying to show. So it's almost like selling your, you know, your, proposal, your research proposal, in a sense, or, or you know, broadcasting yeah, The, the process is really interesting. Absolutely. If you yeah. capture it the right way with the right yeah, tools. Yeah, it's, it's, it's partly showing the public how science works through, <laughs> through that, isn't it? So it's, yeah, and, and using all these different social media tools, Instagram, Snapchat, Facebook, uh, you know, you can post certain things in a certain way and, and start building that brand pretty easily and you can get some good likes and get some good views that way. Okay. Let's talk about some of the other things that they can be doing, um, even within social media. Your research is highly visual, it's mm -hmm. marine, so you get great pictures. What if I am a math scientist or, you know, one of these ones where I am mostly in the lab I don't have high visual stuff. What can they do to make their work still visual and engaging to the audience? Because yes, you can tweet as, as much as you mm -hmm. want, but it's usually the graphics and the, the images that captures people's attention. I guess the key word that you mentioned there is audience. So um, I had a really uh, interesting discussion with a uh, science communicator here about, you know, I, I usually work with mathematicians. How can I get that story across? And I said, well, I guess what's important is to think about your audience. And your audience may just be the broader, um, uh, mathematician community rather than just your tiny little niche within that. So, you know, you can broaden out your communication. Not everything has to be at that, we have a, a sort of 12 year old child rule of thumb for, for most, um, the level of content and complexity. But maybe you're going to, you know, just broaden out what you're doing. So it's interesting to um, that 5,000 people in the world which are actually your audience. Uh, and so, you know, some of these communication uh, outputs we put together, they may be for only one or two people. If it's just for a, specifically for a funder or maybe a philanthropist that might fund your research, if it's just catered to one person, that's okay. So not everything has to be broadcast to the world to be an effective type of communication. But even, and, and most research, I mean, there's very little research that I, I would argue that doesn't actually, even no. if it's theoretical, doesn't have an applied you know, outcome. So your story could be a mathematical modelling. Actually, one of the girls in our course at the moment, she, she's, a, she's modelling uh, traffic impacts and how traffic flows and, and in, in relation to construction and accidents and things like that. You can actually do some great mm, uh, and videography and imagery around that. Well, the, other, the other point, sorry to just interrupt you, yeah. <laughs> the other point that <laughs> I would make it. is that, again, like, as you mentioned before, though, actually, John, was that it's around characters. Mm -hmm. So it can be, you know, it could be a, about the, the researcher too or, or its subject, and you know, so you frame it around a character. Yeah, we... Uh We've partnered with lots of creative people in the past, and you partner with your, your artist friends and your mm. filmmaker friends and your photographer friends, um, and they're, they've got all these creative skills in infographics mm. and graphic design and animation uh, and video production and filmmaking. You, there's lots of different things, even with math, that you can make yeah. re look really slick using you know, some creative graphics. Well, ar artists, artists themselves, creative visual artists, are increasingly actually using mm -hmm. real world data, real data collected by scientists and mathematicians to actually present their art. So they're interpreting the data in, in their sort of way, which is, again, it's another really 
it's, there are stories there. There are stories everywhere. Right. Right? And not everything's serious as well. You know, you, you know, if your research is particularly dry, you could even take a, a slightly humorous approach to that. Mm. Um, you know, you're still respecting yourself as a researcher, but you can see that it's not that accessible, and even that's another opportunity for a bit of humour, and then you're a more of an approachable character that people can relate to. That's a good, that's good <laughs> advice. Uh, you were t you spoke a little bit about, um, about virtual reality. What other kinds of very interesting things have you seen that people have done, whether they're were grassroots initiatives or digital initiatives that are approachable for the average scientist to do? Just something creative out of the box that you've seen over the, over the past. One of the things that I really kind of find amazing at the moment is it's quite, again, it's a visual thing, but actually, again, it comes back to the data and data visualization. And there's some really neat tools now where you can actually, you know, present data um, and present data in such a way that the user actually interrogates it themselves and learns the story as they're interrogating it and they're playing with it. So you're almost using that data and the person is making their own discoveries in a way. And that's a very powerful way of actually telling a story without them necessarily realising that having a story told to, if that makes any sense. So it's, it's particularly good, you know, with more complex issues or controversial issues, you know, may, mm -hmm. maybe a climate change or whatever. So that's, some of the, that's one, one really good example I mean, that I've seen. We, we tend to like the latest technologies for all the stuff that we do, because I'm personally addicted to the technology. I love it. And we fly, you know, we get aerial footage with drones and we get underwater uh, footage and we're using the latest cameras, whether it's phones, we're, we're using the latest virtual reality cameras. But uh, all of it is really inexpensive now. You can get a drone for $500 and you can get that amazing aerial footage of, of something that's happening. And it d doesn't have to be as spectacular as the reef, it could just be the campus or... Um, so, I mean, there's lots of different really inexpensive technologies that people can use and you can learn online using YouTube um, mm. and, and you can, you know, you can be, you can take a course um, and you could be doing all these technologies really easily these days. Um, there's very little barrier to creating great content. Yeah. I think, I think three things which are really useful for scientists, which are pretty inexpensive. One's just photography, uh, you know, to have some photos of what you do, make it visual because you can get information so quickly. Um, the second is infographics. Uh, we're seeing a real big rise in the use of infographics. So, you know, think how difficult it is to get that information you need from a scientific paper. From a spreadsheet. Yeah, from yeah. a spreadsheet. If you can just give people an infographic, they can get the key points of information. And remember, that's not it. Um, that's a hook, and then they can delve down and get more information from that. Um, yeah, we always include. You know, we always include the the website. You want to learn more information? Here's the here's your here's your website. You don't have to give the general public all of your data or all of your information. You just want to get them interested. Yeah. Like get them yeah. hooked the, somehow. The, the other the other really interesting area that I think, um, especially that we've seen over the last two or three years, um, is the whole area of citizen science. Mm. So actually employing the public to do science, uh, whether it's collecting data or it's interpreting data. Um, so there's some really great examples now of how that's working and it can be around, say, gaming. So you're actually playing a game and as you're doing that, you're processing um, data for scientists, whether it be you know, around proteins or stars yeah, yeah, and crazy. universes and stuff. There's some really great examples. So again, it's like engaging people at the same time and, and they're actually contributing to the science. So that's another really cool area. I think even what we're doing right now is another really um, game-changing technology. It's just live video. Uh, we had the opportunity, um, well, it was the year before last now, uh, middle of the Indian Ocean, um, live broadcasting, uh, the tagging of a giant tiger shark and thousands of people from around the world were logging in and asking questions and interacting directly with the scientists as they yeah. were going about their work. Yeah, Ian was the host of a live show that he was filming with his phone while we were out at sea. And this was, this was Periscope that it was called and I, I had downloaded the app and I said, hey Ian, let's try and do some live video mm -hmm. here. And so he's, he's the host of his own show about what was happening. Um, and and it, was, yeah. it was amazing. People were asking live questions and there was this interaction going. And we thought any, anyone could do this. Anyone could have their own show. And it's free. Yeah. So, you know, <laughs> Facebook Live right now, you know, we're talking to potentially yeah. You know, yeah. dozens well, of people. Yeah, someone's, <laughs> who, where are the questions? Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, one thing, you kind of mentioned it with the, with the last conversation. So when they're communicating, they shouldn't just communicate once. They should do it oh. many times. Um, something that we always talk with our, our clients as well is uh, the, the concept of a campaign. Um, so, times when papers come out, media releases come out, they're a big um, milestone in a campaign, but it's great to, you know, preempt that with other information. Um, 
And uh, so we really like that. So we're trying to also uh, work, big projects often have more than one publication, more than one output. So we work with um, large funding organizations and talk with them about how can we build a whole communications campaign around each of your projects so that people can be taken along on that journey. I mean, scientists, we forget how privileged we are. We're the new explorers. You know, um, we're the people that get to go and discover things and see things that no one else in the world gets to see. And, and as a scientist, I feel incredible privilege for that. I mean, I've talked to some really inspiring scientists here that are doing groundbreaking research in the Red Sea. And um, they're describing new species, new worlds. And there's almost obligation to share that beauty. I mean, a lot of people are just in the cubicle right now watching this, uh, wanting to be out there. Um, so, you know, we should share that journey because uh, we have a, a privilege. So with that privilege comes, I believe, a responsibility. I totally agree. Um, it's, we're going to take some questions from the audience now. Does anybody have anything to ask? Well, I will ask another question to, um, to follow up on the topic that you guys were exploring somewhat um, previously in the conversation. Um, do you have any specific sort of tools or pieces of software in specific that you'd like to talk about? Um, this isn't product placement, by the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, no advertising is going on. But um, you know, are, are there specific sites or pieces of software that you could recommend to scientists who aren't graphics professionals, who aren't video editors or designers? Uh, I might just go, I might just go for one to start with. I'm sure we've got ideas. I, I love this website, lynda.com. Um, it's owned by LinkedIn, and it has um, hundreds, maybe even thousands of video courses by some of the best trainers in the world. Quick, concise, um, and you can do courses on everything there from infographics to video production to some really hardcore coding stuff. Um, and they have now entire courses, you know, oh, you want to be an um, uh, online marketer? Well, do this whole series of courses. So uh, we're professionals. We use those courses all the time because technology is changing and techniques are changing. And also the consumers are changing. They're, they're consuming information in different ways. So we've got to stay up to date. But it's quick, it's easy, it's on video. Um, so that, that's my one. Two cents. Yeah, we, we, uh, we love using phones for, for things because it's so easy. And we, we just taught the course this morning in uh, video editing on using a software called Adobe Premiere Clip. It's a free editing software that you edit the footage on your phone. And we made a video in 10 minutes. With just ed and it's as easy as you just drag your finger across and put clips together, add a soundtrack, and you can share it to YouTube right away. And it's pretty simple. So. I think one of really basic um you know, this is a slightly different slant, but um, I just really like uh, ResearchGate as a way to communicate with other scientists. Um, you can publish your data there as well. And we shouldn't forget if we're talking about social networks as well, that LinkedIn, if you're working on something that's pretty applied um, and you share a description of your study and then link into the papers, uh, with that we had a, a shared a paper about um, environmental, environmental impact assessments and whether they should go under peer review. And we had um, hundreds and hundreds of comments, uh, including professors from Stanford and principal investigators from consultancies, really just discussing that. And, and that's a way to, that's, that's a really important audience for that publication. So uh, ResearchGate and LinkedIn, are, um, they're not applications, but they're websites and forums, which I think scientists sometimes forget about. Okay. I have another question just for, have you come across a science communication fail? Like, I'm sure there are scientists that have tried something and you said, oh man, if only they had done this. You don't have, definitely don't give any names. <laughs> <laughs> um, so one of our slides um, that I talk is just, you know, everything you do, it's got to be grandma friendly. So there's lots of things to think about. So what sort of things does grandma not like? Well, she doesn't like it when it's unsafe. And, um, you know, you don't want to get a photo of something happening in the field, someone's not wearing their protective equipment or doing things in the proper way. Um, you know, they don't like racism, violence, sexism, anything like that. So you just have to be really, um, I'd rather, I take, think you should take the approach to be extra cautious, especially if you're doing something like live video. Um, <laughs> because it's kind of like being a goalkeeper, uh, as a, I'm a science communication manager as well. And it um, doesn't matter how many of those goals you save, it's the ones that get past you in the net and they have a big effect on the game. So, um, yeah, yeah. Grandma friendly is a good one. You know, just, just think about what you're doing. If you're, if you're what you want to put out there and your, your mom or your grandma sees it and she's proud of you, then that's going to work. But uh, yeah, anything that is offensive to people or you know, morally wrong, I mean, it's, <laughs> it's, it's like common sense. Is, 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 I, think, I don't know if I can think of any specific 
fails. But <laughs> you know, and think about what's in the background of your shot as well. Right. Uh, you know, you might be doing a great interview, but then something strange is happening in behind. Um, so just little things like that are sometimes things we don't think about. But um, you know, when you're communicating science, it's not always necessarily always good. You know, um, so you need to think about you know what you're communicating, who the audience is, and and make sure that everyone's cool with it. You don't want to also look like um, you're grabbing all the glory and trashing all your uh, collaborators and funders. So make sure that you acknowledge your collaborators, acknowledge your funders, and make sure that everyone who's contributed to that work is being acknowledged because you, know, you don't want to be that guy. Okay. Another question? Yes, we have one here from, uh, from Carmen who asks, what do you tell reluctant scientists that just want to be judged on their publications? Um, people who may view communicating as self-promotion, what do you tell them? Good question. Well, that's really, I mean, it's, it's, not, it's no longer just about publications. I think, uh, you know, this, it, the science is changing. And it, as I mentioned before, it's not just about um, publish or perish. It's actually about creating impact and uh, affecting real world change. And I think, um, I mean, I can only speak from our experience in Australia, but I know it's, it's a similar story elsewhere, that governments, funding bodies are increasingly looking beyond just publications. It has to be relevant, you know, and we have to make the case as scientists to the public for, for making science relevant to the public because there's an increasing kickback for, 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 for that. Yeah. I guess the other thing to remember is you're not alone as a scientist. So, um, you know, we've already talked to a, uh, quite a few science communication professionals at, at CALST who are so keen on what we're doing and want to know about the stories. So um, you don't have to do all this stuff on your own. If you're working at a university or government department, there's people employed to help you. Um, the other idea is, is to do it as a group or as a lab. Um, rather than just be your own brand. So sometimes you may not be comfortable and just, or, or have the time, but you know, if you've got 15 people working in, in a research center or a lab, well, maybe together you can be a brand and, and get that message out um, that way. Good question. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, I'm just gonna close with that. Um, with, as you mentioned, it's not just about the research, it is about the brand and about the science. So the one paper that they're waiting to communicate isn't the whole thing that they need to communicate. It is the process, as you said, and communicating that message throughout. Any closing statements from you guys on what they should do? Any last minute advice? Um, I, my background is, is in filmmaking and, and media and we're always trying to tell personal stories. Everyone's got a great personal story. It doesn't matter, mathematician, scientist, you know, garbage man. Um, one, of the, one of the girls was, is gonna do, a, one of the girls in our class is gonna do a story on recycling on Kaust, and it's totally unrelated to science, but, it, but it's great stories. People, people have great stories. So I, I, that's the big thing we're always trying to get across. Mm -hmm. Tell human stories and people would love it. Um, and I guess the last piece of advice as well is just um, be a little bit humble, you know, um, communicate your uncertainty, communicate your sense of journey because I think sometimes when we try to use big words and we try to sound like we're really certain, maybe smarter than other people, that creates that distance with the public uh, and then they, they don't like us as much and they're less likely to support science. So, you know, just you know, be yourself, but maybe <laughs> some people be a nicer version of that <laughs> and be a little bit gentler and, uh, and, and be a little humble as well. Thank you, guys. This Thank was you. very insightful. Great interview. Thank you. Thank Thank you. you.